Um, my name is Caitlin Reed. I'm an assistant professor in Native American Studies at Humboldt State University, and I am a member of the Yurok tribe. Uh, before we dive into the program, I want to acknowledge that Humboldt State University is on Wiat lands. Uh, Wiat people continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. They're an important part of not only the history of this area, but also in continuing knowledge of this place. Today, we'll be focusing on um, their neighbors to the north, the Yurok tribe, and their uh, battles to protect the Klamath River. But if you don't know whose land you are currently on, I encourage you to educate educate yourself about the history of the place you live and familiarize yourself with the work that those tribal peoples are doing and how you can support. So today our talk is called From Fish Wars to Fish Kill and we have an extremely amazing speaker today, Susan Mastin. She comes from the Yurok tribe of Northern California. She is a lifelong political activist and advocate for tribal and women's issues. She attended Oregon State University where she was elected as the original president of the Native American Student Association. After her degree, she returned to California and worked as a promotion and marketing specialist for United Indian Development Association. As a tribal and national leader, she also served as the second woman to serve as president of the National Congress of American Indians and as the Yurok tribal chairperson from 1997 to 2003 and continued to serve two terms as the tribal vice chairperson. From 1994 to 1996, Ms. Mastin served as the Vice President of the National Congress of American Indians and also as the Pacific Regional Vice President and President from 1999 to 2001. Other positions she's held include the Co-Chair of the National Trust Reform Tax Task Force, Chairperson of the Board of Directors of the Indian Law Resource Center, and Vice President of the National American Center of Indian Enterprise Development. She has served as a Yurok transition team member to implement the Hoopa Yurok Settlement Act, organizing the tribe and creating their tribal base role membership. She was vice chairperson of the Intertribal Monitoring Association on the Indian Trust Fund as well. She has testified before Congress, <laughs> led workshops, given speeches about tribal sovereignty, trust fund and resource management and environmental justice at colleges and professional events throughout the country. Um, uh, she has also served as the Vice President of the Union Bank of California and the Native American Market Division, Chair of Del Norte Democratic Central Committee, and President of Klamath Chamber of Commerce. She founded and became co-president of the Women Empowering Women for Indian Nations and has served over 30 years as the Mistress of Ceremonies at the Indian Film Festival, which is held in San Francisco. She is very active in her traditional Yurok tribal practices, which includes fishing on the Klamath River and responsible for the care and protection of the family ceremony, ceremonial regalia. So Ms. Mastin is incredibly qualified to be educating us all today and we are extremely lucky to have her. Um, we've decided we're going to kick off our session with a five minute video about the Samoth, or the Klamath River fish kill that happened in 2002. And then uh, Ms. Mastin will take it away from there. So I'm going to screen share and share this video very quickly. And bear with me, everybody. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Excellent. I'm going to share my audio.
property is owned by the largest privately held corporation in Oregon, Geldwin. Okay, now we <laughs> It'll be the call of the wall. <laughs> be a regular witch in the eighth van. What have you been doing, huh? Oh. Go hang them up. Where? Mm. Go wash your hands. Not those ones. Because those ones are the ones with salt on them. Just straight salt. Just go ahead. I'll put some on the other guys. Yeah, let's Did they put the toothpicks on them? Yeah, did they have toothpicks on them? This one only had one All right, so Susan, I'm gonna put up your um, slides. Make sure that you're unmuted. Um, and then just let me know what photo you want folks to look at and uh, and then I'll change it. So it's, this is the one I imagine you might wanna start with, but if it's a different one, please let me know. 
Okay, so um, I'm Susan Maston, and I wanted you to know where I came from um, because it speaks to a lot of what path I took in life. So this is my grandparents, Geneva and Emery Matz, and I wanted to uh, show you them. I come from the village of Rekwoy. Um, please let me back up and say thank you to the WIA for allowing us to be um, within their homelands and do this presentation. So this is, are my grandparents and they had a lot to do with influence me in my life in that they um, supported us and encouraged us to get an education and to always present your best and do your best to help um, your family, your community and, and the tribe at large. And then I wanted to show you my great, great grandparents. And I don't know, Caitlin, if you have that up next, but if you can go on to the next, yes. That's my grandmother again. That's me standing up on the left. Oh, here's my grandpa Brooks, my great grandpa Brooks. And that is our family home at Rekwoy in the village. And so that was standing up until just a few years ago and it began to lean and so we took it down and we plan to um, put it back up again in the next year or two. So that's Grandpa Billy Brooks. And then um, on the other side, um, my grandpa's people, this is my grandmother's um, grandpa. And on the other side of the family, I come from um, Captain Tom. And um, he was the, the head man for um, Talwa. So, and this is Captain Tom. So um, when the, in 1979, um, actually in, I'm backing up because in 1975, um, the first case was in 73 and then the Supreme Court case was decided in 75 that reaffirmed our fishing rights on the Klamath River. And so with that, we began to fish openly on the lower um, 40 miles because we were having to fish at night because the state of California intervened and asserted jurisdiction over the Klamath River in 1935. And so um, the, the tribal people upriver could fish. This, this is during the fish wars. This is a painting that my niece drew from a photo. And in it, you will see my uncle Raymond Matz um, on the motor, my mother, Levina Bowers, has a net in her hand, and my grandmother, Geneva Matz, is sitting down in the boat. And this was on a day when um, the federal agents were here. So to back up, the court case happened. We were finally fishing again. Everyone was feeling good about themselves and they were able to provide for their families. And it was a celebration of life. And we felt so good to be back on the water um, during the day. Unfortunately, the business owners in the town of Klamath and the hundreds of fishermen that used to come to the river in the 70s and 60s did not like for us to be on the water. And they were pushing for the Congressman at the time, uh, Bosco and the Senator at the time, Keen, to do anti-Indian uh, gill netting legislation. And they were pushing hard. So there were, you began to see some drafting of legislation. At the same time, um, the, the town site actually held a eulogy and they, closed 101 and marched down the highway um, with a coffin saying that the Indian gill natives were taking hundreds of thousands of fish and were killing their business. And so it was a very volatile time. And I actually seen a bumper sticker in a business that said, can an Indian and save the salmon. And so that's kind of what the temperament was at the time. The fish populations were expected to be very low at, in that year. And so the Department of Interior and um, the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs decided to close the Indian fishery for conservation. And of course, this 
outraged everyone because they were feeling so good about finally being able to provide for their families and that the highest court in the land had made this decision and reaffirmed our fishing rights. And the most significant thing, they declared um, the reservation uh, as Indian country. And that was a significant part also that's used in numerous cases across the land. And that was Matz versus Arnett and Matz versus the Supreme Court. So that's M-A-T-T-Z. And that was my uncle Raymond Matz's court case. And so it reaffirmed our fishing rights and it identified the reservation as Indian country. And those were significant things. So when the interior of the Bureau of Indian Affairs closed our fishery, of course, we were outraged. How could this happen to us? Because we had just won this case in the Supreme Court. And how could we be the only ones sitting on the bank? Because the sport fishermen were still fishing, the ocean commercial and the ocean sport were still fishing. So the only ones who weren't fishing were, were our fishermen. And so we decided to do a protest. And this is probably one of the, the first protests that we actually did on the Klamath River. And um, that we decided that we would put cork lines out without the net attached um, as just a sign of protesting. And then there were nets that were out there also um, to protest the decision of the government to close our fishery and allow for other fisheries to continue to fish during this time where we should have been um, where no one should have been fishing for conservation. So because we were protesting, as you can see on TV and relate to it currently, of course, they called out the federal agents and the state agent, agents to um, protect the river and enforce um, the protection of it. And they looked at themselves at that time as being the hero as they were there to save the salmon. So they were in full riot gear, you can see they had helmets with shields, um, bulletproof vests, and they carried M16s. They also had the billy clubs and they had large boats. And when they came, they would tap their billy club on the side of the boat so you could hear them coming. And it was more to just antagonize us. And, but we were extremely fearful because it was my uncle's court case. We, he was picked on a lot and went after a lot simply because of his name in the court case. And so anytime that you would hear the large boats coming, you know, everyone would hurry to be down there so that they could witness um, what was going on and, and hopefully keep someone from being killed because that's how high the tensions were on both sides. But uh, we were fortunate, no one was killed, but a lot of things happened like holding people's head under the water that was in the boat, um, dragging women across the beach by their hair, a lot of arrests and these arrests because it's federal were felonies. And so we have a lot of people who ended up with felony over trying to protect our fishing right and standing up for our fishing right, which was totally you know, not okay in these times. And I can remember one time because I was naive and I just came from college and I was you know, out to conquer the world and I, you know, everything was good. And I remember saying to my mom, well, if we just follow the laws then they can't do anything. And I'll, I'll never forget, she looked at me and she said, not all laws are created justly. And that was something that stuck with me that um, for a long time to be able to see and understand the injustices because who's writing the laws white men at the time because there were not a lot of women in Congress or the Senate. And so um, it was a lesson that I learned and that I always kept in my mind as I moved forward. And it probably the fish wars instilled upon me that, um, that commitment to fight for and protect our fishing and water rights and our hunting rights and all the rights that were entitled to us um, 
and protected for us by the creator. And so, you know, that um, it, was a, it was a very serious time, a very difficult time. And I can remember one time when they, my uncle lived in a 12 by 60 trailer and the agents came in the middle of the night got up his three little children and his wife and him, and they were holding guns on them because they were looking for fish that they knew that he had in the trailer, I guess. So you can see it just was tense times. And this has happened to other people too, across the country, um, you know, at, during our history. So it's not something unique to us. It just was the first time in recent history that we were, um, in this position where no one was standing up, the government who is our trustee and responsible for ensuring that, you know, the resources are protected for us um, for all time, did not stand up for our rights, but instead um, enforced a closure on us when everyone else was fishing. So it was difficult. So you can imagine that even today, if you talk about, because of the intensity of it, that there were incidents where uh, one of them was the, there was a gathering because poor um, Al Gray, he's passed now, but it was his 81st birthday. And so a bunch of people had gathered around and they, they had dinner on the beach down at the south on the north bank at the mouth of the river. And there was probably about 30 to 50, um, India, I have to say they're Indians of the reservation because we weren't organized yet. So there were there were Talawas there, there were Hoopa there, there, and then of course the Yurok's were there. And um, it it was dark, and they were singing some some um, prayer songs, and it was a beautiful night. And then all of a sudden, they could see hundreds of flashlights coming down the hill. And if you've been at the mouth of the Klamath River, you know how that looks. That night, my grandfather tried to stop him because it said he, he said they were on our allotment, which was private land. And they just grabbed him and hurt him and ended up hauling him to jail um, at the same time. But my sister was there and she said everyone thought that, that they were gonna die, that they just knew because it had, gotten to the point where things were so intense that they knew that that night they were gonna die. And so some, you know, all they could do was just pray louder. And she said, even the women sang that nobody knew the song, but everyone was singing the song. And she said, and they sang it louder and louder and louder and they kept coming. And so, um, it was it was a horrific experience for them, and that's why today, if you talk to any one of those who were actively involved in the um, in the fish war and the protests, um, they will most likely cry, and um, and it's easy to see why because it invokes so much pain and uh, sorrow and. Um, and just that feeling of um, hopelessness and and not and then anger, anger for the government for not standing up for us, anger, you know, for not protecting us, and just in general, um, it's like a post-war syndrome. That's exactly what they all have, and so much to the point that my mom, I never heard her swear when we were growing up, and she was not a mean person. But I can remember when I was going into the BAA court and I guess about three of the worst agents that were on the river, they were cocky and they were just obnoxious. And they were coming out the door as I was going in and they, were, and they said, oh, well, too bad we didn't meet you earlier. And then I had a little sports car and I was going somewhere. Well, they were following me. So my mom and my sister jumped in the car and they went, racing behind me because they were so worried that something was going to happen to me because these agents who were particularly bad were following me to the point that they were going to pass and my mom um, got behind them and a car was coming, a large truck was coming towards them and my mom didn't move. 
and and so because <clears throat> that's the frame of mind that they were in that she was going to cause for them to be hit by that car rather than trying to protect me <clears throat> so i'm telling you this because it makes it even more difficult as we move into the next phase so everything's going on you've got a the, the businesses calling their congressmen and senators, trying to get them to do anti-Indian legislation. You have our fishermen, they're sitting there and they don't want anything to do with the state. They don't want anything to do with the feds. <clears throat> and they most certainly don't want them to be counting their fish or to be um, uh, even around them, to be talking to them. <clears throat> this is it. So um, we, we formed a um, Klamath River Traditional Indian Fishers Association. And we um, sent notices to all the people that we knew um, who were fishermen. We posted it in the paper and, and we held a meeting to begin to form an organizational structure because the tribe wasn't organized where we could begin to combat some of the anti-Indian um, gill net fishing and uh, the legislation that was being developed. So um, we held a meeting. Um, they selected me as the chair. So I was the spokesperson. <coughs> and um, we began to write letters. We wrote um, all kinds of letters. We got our family, we got our friends, we got everyone to write letters to the Congressman and the Senator um, in not support of um, any anti-Indian um, let gill netting uh, legislation. And it worked because there, there, um, there never was a piece of legislation. But at the same time, we began to, because of um, all of the businesses and the um, elected officials positions, I got involved with the, the Klamath Chamber of Commerce and with the Democratic Party of Del Norte County and because it's more difficult and, and this is what I hope you take away from this is it's important to develop relationships. It's harder for you to hate when you know someone and you like them. And so in order to change a mindset um, in a time where it's so bad that you have, you know, can an Indian save a salmon um, bumper stickers, we had to make some strides in order to break that barrier down. And we continued to meet. Um, we, we had to uh, work with our uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and the BIA with account for our fish because what was motivating people to take action um, with legislation was the locals saying there were hundreds and thousands of pounds of salmon being taken off the river by the Indian gill netters. And so um, that's what was the driving force. And so they were saying that we were gonna deplete the river. So it, it was very difficult for our fishermen to be able to sit down and have those discussions. And um, we decided uh, BIA had developed some regulations for us. So we took those regulations and we tried to make them ours and had input into um, that process as a starting point. And then um, we began to develop a rapport with the biologists and, um, and a way for us to begin to develop a, a, a data to show that we weren't um, the main cause of the depletion of the salmon. So it wasn't an easy task and it took a, a lot of meetings for us to go up and down the river. Um, and of course, I had a lot to learn um, from our fishermen just about the runs in the Klamath River, the timing of the runs in the Klamath River so that I would be able to um, sit with others and talk about um, the fish runs and uh, be a, a part of the discussions for the decision on the harvestable fish. And so um, 
at that about the mid 80s, the Klamath River Restoration Act passed and it created um, a management forum on the Klamath River of representatives from the, the state fishing game, the sport fishery, the ocean sport, the commercial fishery, and they had a hoopa position and a non hoopa position because we were still the Hoopa Valley Reservation at that time. And so the non Hoopa representative, um, the Fishermen's Association decided that I needed to start attending those meetings and uh, providing input and, and advocacy for our fishery. Um, at the time, the decision for you know how much fish was available and who got what allocation for the management of, of uh, Fall Chinook um, for the whole Pacific um, Coast came from the pa uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And so the Klamath Fisheries Management Council um, did recommendations to the PFMC and they usually took those recommendations. So I, my family and the association um, did a petition to ask that I be placed in the non-Indian seat. And so um, they recognized that because they didn't have anyone else and no one else had came in with um, that showed any kind of support at that time. And so I was able to secure that seat because of the support of our fishermen and um, and I was elected as the vice chair of that body. So we began to have play and in influential. There's me, I'm 26 years old, talking to my uncle about fishing, of course, anytime that we had any kind of family gathering or gathering of the fishermen, um, the, the time was spent uh, talking about the fishery and what was going on and what we could do. And, um, how could we influence the decisions we're making and, um, and positions we should take um, at the next meetings. And so um, we, I did a quick study. I also contacted the tribes to the north and um, went and seen Billy Frank. Billy Frank is like our, our Raymond Matz, he, his Supreme Court case. Um, reaffirmed their fishing rights in, in Washington state. So in the Bolt case. And so um, I had him come down and talk to our fishermen about the importance of participating in the management process and the importance of uh, organizing and um, just gave um, some very good pointers to our fishermen uh, to help us in that organizational phase. So um, from there, we began to uh, push, we developed relationships, very close relationships with fish and wildlife biologists, and they ran our numbers, which were used to determine the um, harvest for, because they allow for an escapement and they allow for harvest. And so in the harvest is split between the ocean fishery, the um, ocean sport fishery, the, the river sport fishery, and um, the Indians of the reservation. So between Hoopa and Europe. So we did have a negotiation with Hoopa at that time in the early 90s. Um, to be able to split the the harvest for the tribe. So in the in the early 90s, we had worked close with Fish and Wildlife. We had visited um, Fish and Wildlife regional offices and local offices and DC um, to make sure they understood the Yurok fishery and that they were supportive of the Yurok fishery. We also met with the regional and local BIA and the Department of uh, Interior Secretary and the um, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, just so that they always knew what was going on 
so that they, we wanted to have their support because we were moving for not less than 50% of the harvest. Um, and because the court case didn't define, you know, um, our allocation, it just uh, reaffirmed our fishing rights. So we were moving towards discussions with them by keeping them informed on what's going on and asking finally, when there was going to be a good size run um, in the early 90s, we asked for Interior to do an opinion for our allocation. And we asked for the local BIA, or the regional BIA to attend the uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting to tell, put them on notice that we would be taking 50% of the harvest, which is very significant. But it took years since 1979 to 90 to lay the groundwork with each of the offices and including the National Marine Fisheries um, because they, we needed all of them to be in support of what we were, what we were going for because it was a too important and we couldn't afford to lose. So it was important that we covered all of our bases and were prepared um, when we went to ask for that. We also wrote um, an opinion and forwarded it to the solicitor because we wanted to help in the structuring of that, um, of that opinion. So we wanted to give them all the information, all the court cases that were relevant so that it was easier for and we could influence um, that decision. So um, after asking for that, then the uh, Klamath Fisheries Management Council, we put them on notice. They still developed a, a harvest plan that provided for about, um, I think 33% um, of, the, of the available harvest and the, the, the rest went to um, the tribal fisheries. So, but when uh, BIA and, and put the Pacific Fisheries Management Council on notice and they came out with that harvest plan, then once the plan went in, the Secretary of Commerce, who we had been keeping close contact with, issued an emergency regulation. And he, his regulation called for an increase in the escapement from 35 to uh, 38 because it was a low year and a 15% for the ocean fishery. And so that was um, unacceptable, of course, to the, to the trollers and they filed a suit, which was called a Parvono versus Babbitt. And uh, we lost and um, then when it went to the Ninth Circuit, we appealed and uh, the tribe, because of my years of involvement, we were at that time the in, in, Yurok Interim Council which was the base role members election of five individuals um, to serve as the interim council while they developed the constitution for the Yurok tribe because the Hupa Yurok Settlement Act happened in 1988. And that act caused, um, called for the division of the Hupa and Yurok reservations. And so now all of a sudden we were a, a government and, um, and we uh, were able to, to uh, move with BIA on that um, decision. And they let me come in as the intervener. So you'll see um, Parvono versus Maston also because um, I was able to intervene on behalf of our tribe. So it was a great honor for them to do that and allow for me to be the one, instead of the interim um, tribal council, they allowed for, for to be my name on the document. So I, I was honored with that and, um, and we won. 
in that case. And so it was upheld and from that time on, um, we have had not less than 50%. The solicitor's opinion at the time though actually said um, no more, either a moderate standard of living or 50%, uh, whichever was less. And so we have taken 50% ever since that um, decision was upheld. And that would have been in the early 90s, um, probably 91. And uh, from also that's when Hoopa and BIA and, and myself with um, a couple of um, interim council members sat down with them and negotiated for an 80-20 split. And what I used in those negotiations at the time was um, the historical take of the Hoopa tribe. And it had been 10%. And so through the negotiations, um, we reached the 80-20 the split. Now with the dams, when the dams come down and salmon return upriver, um, then the Klamath tribes will be looking for a percentage and we may have to sit down and renegotiate the allocation. At this current time, um, the Kuruk fishery just has a state recognized fishing right. And so their allocation actually comes from the state's allocation although they're working towards getting um, federal uh, fishing rights. And at the time that they do um, get uh, those fed that federal recognition, we'll have to sit down again and have a discussion for an allocation share at that time. So um, we, things were pretty regular. The, the next big battle that we had on our hands um, starting in the 90s because the fish populations were um, not always healthy and um, it come, we kind of bounced around. We had a, a very good year um, where there was a, an abundance of a lot of fish and um, we were able to hold our first commercial fishery, but still it was a struggle. Nothing has ever been easy and we've always had to fight for um, every step of the way. And, and the fishermen, of course, they think that that's just the way it was because our rights were reaffirmed. We had 50%, the government was gonna always do what's right, but that's not the case. Every time we went, we had to um, fight for those extra fish, whether it be 200, 500, or whatever, we would always be looking at the numbers and trying to crunch them in a way that would provide for more fish for uh, the tribal fishery. And um, so the, our next big battle was water. And because there were such large populations that were coming, we had extreme, and this is where um, climate change is influencing our river in that our runs are running later than what they did in the 70s. They're running, you know, three to four weeks later than what we have been um, receiving in, in uh, previous years. So, and also extreme high temperatures, drought years um, have also been a signs of um, the climate change in the area the temperature is, is becoming hotter um, than it was previously. So when you have low, um, low flows and extreme heat, then your temperature rises in, in the river and you have like 70 degrees, 71 degrees temperature in the river, then fish begin to hold up. They don't come into the, the river, they hold up in the ocean. And when they do come into the river, they congregate at the mouths of tributaries. And Blue Creek is, a, is one of the main streams um, in the lower Klamath where they would hold up in that pool um, before they would head on up river. And uh, fish carry a disease 
um, in their gills and gill rot is a common term. It's not the scientific term, but it's the one I'll use today. And uh, when they come into close contact like that, when you have hundreds that are piled up in a pool, that's when they um, uh, transfer that disease and um, it, it ends up killing them. But we had been working, uh, fighting with um, the government, the Bureau of Reclamation to release more water in those times of um, low flows to be able to help the fish to move on up to spawn. So every year has been a battle um, getting the BOR to live up to its trust responsibility because they um, tend to provide for the irrigators up rivers needs. And of course, politics plays into it. So it depends on what your secretary um, and the, the uh, whether you have a Republican or a Democrat in office tends to also be. Um, the Democrats have sponsored um, conservation measures and, and we have a listed uh, species, the coho are listed. And so we always try to manage our fisheries to provide for those coho to be able to make it up and spawn. And then we have the spring and the fall chinook um, fishery that's also threatened to be listed. So you would expect that the government would live up to its trust obligations and that they would decide in favor of the fishery resource and the tribal fisheries. But that is not what happens. And so every year we go into negotiations over providing for the river. <clears throat> and even in times when there are no fish and you think, oh, the the harvest allocation process will be so much easier and no one will fish this year because it's so bad that you get there and everyone wants to fight for that last fish, which is so contrary to what we believe and that you're supposed to be providing for tomorrow and future generations. But in order to protect a fishing right, you have to be there for that share. And that's what is really painful and what people struggle with because it's not what we're taught. It's not what we believe. But in order to protect that right, there are times when we have to, um, to ensure that those rights are protected. Because if it appears that we don't need fish, then, um, then that will be taken. So um, I struggle with that all the time uh, when, when we had fishing negotiations because um, it wasn't what I as a Yurok person was taught and it's not what I as a Yurok person believed. And so um, it was a different playing field and in order to um, preserve and protect the rights for us today and tomorrow, those are petitions that were, were necessary and they never felt good. And it never felt good when we went home and talked disgusted as um, with the tribal fishermen either, but it was a decision that they backed and that I advocated at the table. So um, <clears throat> we, we got uh, uh, fighting for the water there were several attempts to sit down with the irrigators so that they could understand, you know, our position and um, the difficulties we were having with, um, you know, protecting the fish and being able to um, have the water when they needed to go up to spawn and the water that was necessary for us um, to be able to have for our ceremonies. And in particular with our jump dance uh, and the boat dance that above everything else that that, um, that time we needed to have those additional flows in order to um, protect who we are as a people. So <clears throat> in, um, in 2002, um, a, about a month before the um, 
the fish kill. We were in a meeting with uh, Bureau of Reclamation and uh, the irrigators talking about um, what the season was looking about at and the high temperatures and the, the temperature I think was already at 70 at that time. And we were um, asking for the water um, to be released. Um, and I actually questioned the integrity of the commissioner because um, how could they not provide for um, the necessary flows to ensure that the um, fishery was provided for, especially when that was their trust uh, responsibility and obligation to the resource and to um, the tribal fisheries. And um, I warned them because I just felt in my gut and soul that there was going to be a fish kill because the numbers were going to be so high and the temperatures were going to be extremely high and the flows were so low. And that's when it happened. We started to get phone calls um, over the weekend. I took a ride up river um, with one of the fish techs and um, I, I actually invited a commercial fisherman to go up also. Um, to see what was going on. And it was the worst thing that you can imagine. Um, there were hundreds of fish that were floating in the river and they were stacked on the banks at least five deep. And uh, all the way from the mouth of the Klamath to Blue Creek, which is about 20 miles up the river. And if you can imagine the stench of salmon that are rotting and the sight of so many adult Chinook um, laying in the pools that you've seen earlier in the video. It was, it was horrific and I never want for any of my children or grandchildren to ever see that in their lifetimes. But it's a reality that we face and I actually think that we are vulnerable in this year for another fish kill. Um, and the only saving grace, unfortunately, is that there is a low um, population, an extreme low population of fish that are projected to come in this year. So that may be the only thing that saves us from a fish kill, because if we had a, a larger population, we most certainly would be having another fish kill. And the numbers um, that were said earlier are really underestimated. Um, the Department of Fish and Game estimated the number to be around 68,000 adult Chinook and our biologists just estimate it to be up to 85. Um, thousand dead adult Chinook in a 20 mile um, range. So um, that kind of brings us um, to the point we, it, we um, tried to get a lot of national attention, which really is disturbing to me because to not think that it should be covered by national media when you have you know, 80,000 dead adult Chinook in a 20 mile st uh, stretch is unacceptable. And you would expect that every major newspaper, every major network would be there documenting this. But we had to actually um, fight to get people to come. You know, we had to, you know, beg them to come to be able to see what was going on. And, and of course, we joined with the um, fishermen, the ocean and sport fishery, and the environmentalists. We have developed the great relationships with them over the years, and um, we were able to bring some, um, some media here locally. We also um, coordinated with our congressman and took 500 pounds of adult Chinook to Washington, D.C., and put it on the stairs at the Department of Interior building and held a press conference where I spoke and the Congressman spoke and we did receive a lot of um, media attention, of course, at that event. Um, we have had some successes with BOR. 
um, it, with winning for the resource and, and the tribal fisheries, um, with getting increase in flows for our ceremonies. And, um, but we have also had years where they did not provide for um, the river. And of course, one of them was when the fish kill did occur. So it's an ongoing battle. We are, you know, have been actively engaged in um, the removal of the dams. And I can say that um, while the tribe takes a position that grassroots advocacy is an important thing and that we constantly need to be training our young people about the history of our fishery so that they can, you know, everyone understands and we all come from the same knowledge base about, you know, how did we get where we're at and what are the things we need to be doing to protect and promote the dam removal and to protect um, our water and fishing rights. And it is a responsibility though, if you are going to, you know, be active in, in your um, fight for the river, it is important that you do understand what has happened in the past and that you do understand what the position of the tribe is because you need that basis for your arguments to be solid. You need to understand what the science is saying. You can't just go out there and say, we demand this. You need to understand the history and you need to understand the science so that you can be successful in your role for our fisheries and for our um, communities and tribal members. Because once you step out there, you take on a whole new role of responsibility and you cannot be out there on your own and expect to have success and do what's right for um, our people and the protection of our, of our resources and rivers. 